Hello, everyone. Well, <laughs> are we going? <laughs> the, the traditional shuffling of screens. Oh, yeah. right. Uh, we're streaming. Hey, everyone. Sorry we're a little late today. Yeah, that was my bad. Doing a little office maintenance. Um, this is Classic Quests. Uh, every other week or so, every week, uh, we take on the world of Richard Garriott, Lord British, and the Ultima series. Uh, we're just kind of paused on Ultima 4 for some time to, to go through, see what we can glean from this before moving on to other classic role-playing games. My name's Chris. I'm a PhD student in the English department here at UWM. And I'm Thomas Malaby. I'm a professor of anthropology here at UWM. And <clears throat> Scott Bruner, uh, also a PhD student at uh, UWM Milwaukee. So we are on our fourth week now. Uh, we've gotten a little bit further. Um, oh, good. So we don't have our camera. Oh yeah. Uh -oh. That's plugged. Oh, it's into probably plugged into the other one as well. All right, so we're doing. Do we go without a camera today? Yes. <laughs> Let's start this up again. Thank you, Nvidia, for. Updating or whatever it did to completely throw you off. <clears throat> I need to transcribe my notes somewhere where we can all access them. Unfortunately, um, as I've noted, time is not been my friend recently. So we, we're, we're journeying onward today, correct? Yeah, I don't remember where we were at last time. It's been a couple weeks, so... Um. We were done. right outside a city. Can I, I don't know. Yeah, this is this is about where we were. We had picked up Iolo either was it from this? From Vesper? Yeah, this is Vesper. Um, and this town gives a lot of exposition. It actually helped us uh, figure out exactly what we're supposed to be doing. One must we met a solemn ranger by the name of Randall in Ves Vesper who tracks the shrines. Let us know that we must visit each shrine for one, two, or three cycles. So what we do know at this point is that we need to well, we need to level up, grind, <clears throat> grind our character in the correct, you know, virtues. We have to demonstrate capacity and honesty, compassion, valor, justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality, and humility. But we also need to track down the runes for each virtue, as well as the mantra to use in the shrines. And we also have to find the location of the shrines. D didn't we get a mantra? Yes, we have, yes. This is why I need to upload these notes. Well, here's the shrine here. Ooh. Oh. Troll. <clears throat> oh, for, oh, oh, goodness. What is that? Gonna go ahead and leave. <laughs> uh, the rune of entry. So, so we don't know what this. Oh no, we do know. So this is the shrine of sacrifice. Um, okay, I need to put my notes in some type of order because this is going to be difficult. So, Vesper. Was southwest of the shrine. Is that correct? Oh, 
Oh, you have a companion now, I forgot. <sighs> oh! <coughs> what the heck? So we have just lost Valor. Oh, because I ran? Because he ran. No, this is what I was saying before. I like... thought discretion was the better part of Valor. <laughs> yeah. Oops, now I've lost other things. I'm just not, uh... And we're poisoned, so... Oh. I'm a giant seahorse. I want to find whoever did the sound design for these games. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. That is brutal. Maybe I'll bring my laptop and we can keep the notes directly on that. Ugh. Abshai is no mo no longer with us. Uh, is there any way to get him recuperated? Yeah, we have to find a healer who will cast the resurrect spell. How we we got three hundred ninety one gold? Oh, what does the guild do? See, this is yeah. Long John Leary, the guild shop. Ah. Ooh. Sounds like something that might come in handy. So, again, this is kind of spoilerish here, but I don't think we have any use for torches, magic gems, or magic keys until we have access to the underworld, uh, okay. to the dungeons. So, this is, I think he's selling stuff just for dungeon navigation, and I learned that knowledge is just from playing this game as a kid. Traveling Dan, wasn't that in Forrest Gump? <laughs> yeah, what was it? <laughs> Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> yeah. Now, Traveling Dan the Tinker Man. It's possible that Dan might join us. Oops. Tinker. That one is a Vesper house. The guild shop. Vesper is associated with sacrifice. Oh, do we know that? Actually, I don't know if I know that. No, you said repair. I think. Yes. Hmm. All right. Might as well try rune. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe it's just my mood today, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, this is one of the shortcomings for this game, is the, like, already turning, like, the social aspect which is probably the best as quality of this game into another grind. You yeah. know, just going through the motions. Oh gosh, yes. Like, what do I have to go? What What's the whole list of commands that I can ask people? Right. And you know, it, it, limitations, but. Well, I think there's yeah. I mean, I'm, again, remembering how I played this game originally, any time that somebody would respond to, I mean, I so few people actually say anything like that's interesting about health, and then every once in a while. When you do get that interesting answer, it's always like, that was, it was exciting. Master. Oh, you go. Hmm. Oh. Yes, because I think it's British. He or she. Yeah, I appreciate the. Gender inclusivity? Yes. Binary as it may be. <laughs> Fields? Oh, yes. Hmm. Oh. Can you try fields? Hmm. It's a good thing we don't have the camera on. They'd see me yawning a fair bit today. <laughs> I don't know how much is the game and how much is just, I don't know, we'll sure on sleep. It's Finish just the weather. Mm hmm. Could be. Finished my class playing at 4.22 this morning. Were, were you up that whole time? Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm usually up at Borrow. 4, but... <laughs> Type in euphemism. No. <laughs> <laughs> Horses. Ah. A horse thief. 
Okay, mm -hmm. what is, do we have a Pause. name for this thief? This is, my notes are crap. We need, I need to put these together. So we have a thief, do we know his name? Uh, I'll find, um, we'll get to you in a second. Sure, yeah, no worries. My question here is, if we steal the horses, will that drop our, uh, one of our virtues? It might increase bravery. <laughs> <laughs> is resourcefulness a virtue? Wimp. Is situational ethics a virtue? No. Yeah. Is Thief one of the classes that we need to have somebody join us? Well, it, was Iolo the one from this town? I can't remember. So, I, this is interesting to me. Um... If we want to talk about classes in classic role-playing games, they would make up a party. And I'd never noticed it until now, thinking about Daika, which we've just met. Thief is not among the characters that we can recruit. Mage, bard, fighter, druid, tinker, paladin, ranger, shepherd. Um, thief is such a large part of... Uh, the idea of the thief character is such a large part of Dungeons & Dragons, which, of course, is the, you know, the progenitor of this game. It's interesting... Well, I wonder if that's one of uh, Garriott's responses to the feedback that he got about the, you know, the the last game that it was a murder hoboey that it was around you know killing things and but I don't know but now I'm but I don't know if Thief was a class in Ultima Three as well but I find that an interesting admission especially since the rogue and the thief it, you know that archetype is so integral to role playing games. Since humility is the opposite of pride, so is its mantra. Oh, that's a pretty big clue. Yeah, they must, you must say it backwards. So, E-D-I-R-P, perhaps. Oh. What did you say, no? Do we have that? I've got to, I've got to upload these posts. <laughs> Just scan it in with some OCR technology and read it. Yeah, how's your handwriting? Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys play. Oh, well, we have ho, I, o, he, hum. That, and I don't know what mantra that is. Oh no. Of course, what like two? Wasn't quick... that? Weren't we talking about mercy at that time or compassion? No. Keep Google searches and I can put this all together. Let's see. Justice. In reverse it for humility. Compassion. That's compassion. Yeah, compassion, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Captain, obviously. Thank you. Oh, there's the Twin Gates. He didn't put in here the knights who say knee. I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. that made an appearance. <clears throat> I'm just thinking of the, rep you know, how repetitive the game is. It's kind of has a bit of that quality to it. Oh yeah, didn't we talk to this guy already? Yeah, we did. But <laughs> what? It was just funny. I was seeing that in like a real encounter. Hello, I'm Randall. All right, we're good, Randall. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Randall. We have your. It's like we're taking a census. <laughs> yeah, right. Like we're walking around Britannia with these three questions. Yeah, no I mean, more. No more need to be done. We're good. <laughs> good. Poor Iolo is carrying around our PC's uh, dead body. Mm hmm. 
That's a lot of enemies out there. Is, cause, is it because there's two of us now that we're getting more? Yes. But when we talk about mechanics, this is an early example of what we would now call level scaling. You're not even dying. Fight me, you coward. I'm gonna, I'm gonna print out a version of this map that I can mark up as to where these places are. Oof. Well, let's. That, that's a great question. Um, I mean, how do we do? We want to head back to my, to Britannia to try to heal mm -hmm. up Abshai. Mm -hmm. And that's west. That is directly west. I think if you follow the the water, you'll get there. I, yeah. Next time, I'm gonna print off a version of map and we'll start marking up. But it's interesting too, I mean, I think, in, in this case, I mean, at some point you're going to have to start running. You're not going to be able to take on hordes of orcs all day long. So... Convince me. Much <laughs> <laughs> uh, crap. Oh. So yeah, this will be a quick way to get back to Britannia. Do you lose anything when you die? I think you lose equipment and gold. But uh, don't quote me on that. More traps. Is Rogue one of the? No. No, that's Bart's what you're just saying, one, right? Yeah. Bart, can, is there anyone that can disable traps? Ooh, yeah. that's a good question. I mean, that's the class of we're playing that in opening locks, right? Right. Jeez, look at you. All is dark. But wait. I like that this portion is like out of my control. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the book about thieves being able to un, um, unlock or you know detrap chests. There is a spell that you can use. So I, I mean, I don't, this is kind of a, an interesting point to mention that this is unlike other games of the era, especially Bard's Tale and Wizardry games, in that we don't have permadeath here. Um, we are actually rebooting from another location now. If you guys played the Wizardry or Bard's Tale games, when I played them in my Apple IIc, and I had my party created, whenever we encountered a, a group and they defeated us, that happened not often, but often enough, the, it would instantly set all of your characters as dead. Mm -hmm. The way to stop it from doing that was to turn the power off immediately yeah. because it couldn't save it to disk in the time. Oh, so that was what we did for all those that. games. You'd have zero hit points and you knew you had about, about 15 to 20 seconds before it started saving it to your disk so you threw off the power on my Apple IIc. Wow. Here, we don't have to do it. And that was, that was a really annoying thing that we did. And I don't I never think we were did alone yeah. in doing it. Um, I mean, all my friends were all playing the games. So that's, that was to rigueur. Um... Lord British is allowing us to bypass. So your gold went from 400 to 200. No, it was 600, actually. Oh, was it? 613 Ooh. after all those encounters. So that went down to two. So we lost 400 gold, but we got 
both of us back to full health. Well, I don't know if we lost any food. I maybe. Oh, sure. Uh, I don't know, if, but some possessions. Did we lose some possessions? You might want to quickly check whether we've got the same weapons. <clears throat> Sling leather. Yep. So we're good. Okay. So it's not so bad. It's a setback. But it's actually not a setback because we were headed to Britannia to pay a lot of gold right, to get that's what unpoisoned. I was thinking. Yeah. So it's uh, it's probably potato potato because we have probably the same amount of gold we lost as how much we would have spent. That being said, narratively, my character's spending a lot of time in the uh, the netherworld and has to have psychic repercussions. All right, so where are we headed on the map? So we are here at this large castle. Mm -hmm. We don't know because there, I mean, a few settlements are listed here and there. I'm pretty sure that the last place we were was right around here. Mm -hmm. And that's Vesper. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll print, I'll photocopy things so we can start putting where the maps, where the things are. Um, we have so far the Rune of Compassion and the Mantra of Compassion, I believe. But we, you know what you might want to do? So we just need to check in with Hawkwind, um, the guy who will give us some feedback on how we're doing on each of the. That's in Britannia. It's in Britannia. Yeah, he's on the second floor. He's I want to say he's in the same level as Lord British. Is that the? It's behind all those force fields. Yes, the sleep fields. Just because we're here, it kind of makes sense. It also. Did we talk to Lord British? We didn't get. We might have gotten enough experience for the next level. Oh. Does it ever list our experience? I don't think so. A rather abstract process. No. Oh, he just does it automatically. He does. As soon as we talk to him, he says, uh, you've reached the next level. So we have not. I wonder if dying that way? Oh. Uh, has an experience point cost as well. But again, because... The oh, don't go down. He was saying it was up here, right? I can't remember. Oh, if you know where Hawkwind is, yeah. feel free. Was it a... I'm, the only thing I do know is it's on the left, not the right of the castle. Ooh. That looked like a... Uh, what is that character in D and D? The beholder. It's like a reaper. Otiuk. Oh, Otiuk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was wrong about being on this level. I think you have to go to the basement. We put the rulers in the third level. Or our mystics. Below. Now we're going to fall asleep. So let's go ahead and why don't we walk through. We're here in Britannia. Shall we say compassion? We, yeah, we can. We have, we have not been compassionate enough. Nope, we are not valorous. You want to try justice? Sacrifice. That no for three here. Um, we died for our, you know, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's, at least it's, it's small. Honor. Spirituality. Just to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're both there. That's funny. Nice. Spirituality and humility are the last two. And humility, you said? And humility is the final one. There you go. So we are, we have, mm. we are not here, I will mark it as, we have been hum, humile enough. <laughs> <laughs> humile. <laughs> all, all those deaths. So, and he's telling us oh, that wait. we have to go, and so he also, the other thing that we have to find out, this, this uh, Ultima is really an adventure game for the first, uh, I mean, it really is. We are, 
We, this is adventuring it more than it's an RPG with RPG elements. Anyway, we have to find out how many cycles we have to say the mantra. He for. did say something. He said there. three cycles. Um, we do not have anything other than uh, we are now humble enough. We know we have to do three cycles, but we have neither the mantra nor the rune, and I don't. We know. don't know where the shrine is either. Is it Magentia or was that Pride? Magentia oh, was Pride. Oh right, one of them was. For the sake of anyone listening or watching, do you, can you give the, um, what's the difference between adventure game and role playing game? <clears throat> in, in 20 words or less. I yeah. I, <laughs> geez, I'll, take, I don't, I mean, that's I, I'll take a crack at it. Yeah, please. I mean, I think adventure games are mystery kind of driven it's sort of like ex exploration and figuring things out there's often like get the thing that will allow you to do this thing right find the components of the robot so you can go back and rebuild it right where and there might be some character progression but the emphasis de is definitely not on that whereas rpgs the emphasis is much more the spotlight is on the person they're often the hero of the narrative but a lot of mechanics are devoted Along with that, a lot of mechanics are devoted to leveling up, gaining skills, getting more powerful. That's mm -hmm. how I differentiate them. Mm -hmm. The adventure character is often, in many of them, the same person in terms of their capabilities at yeah. the end that they were at the start. And in role-playing games, that's almost never true. Right. And I think of an adventure game as like a, like a Zork or a right. Colossal Cave. Right. Um, Planet Fall, something like yeah. that. There's like these puzzles. Uh, Mist. Yeah. Um, Considering I wrote for VentureGamers.com, but I mean the, the the you know I'm well I think it's interesting and, and Stuart pointed this out the other day and I felt really stupid because I'd never really put this together but he pointed out that if you, the term adventure game doesn't come from the style of play that you're adventuring although you are but it literally is a reference to Colossal Cave Adventure mm -hmm. and I had never uh, actually put that together um, me either actually so but I, I but mean there, yeah that's right that's the one where you know you find yourself at a, like there's the little stream or whatever there's yep. the little hole in the ground. Making my uh, students play that in my game culture I class. Like um, I have never played. I have never really gotten farther than that. But I mean, I so played the whole thing. Oh my gosh! Really? Yeah. I feel like I have to. I feel like it's almost a ritual. I may have played the whole thing twice <laughs> at different points in my life, actually. Right when it first came out, and then I think when I went back to it. Wow. Like five years later. Huh. We're playing this. Sorry, I'm a quick tangent. So oh. in my game culture class, we're playing a game called Kentucky Route Zero. Have you guys heard mm -hmm. of it? Yeah. Uh, have you played it? We played it, uh, Serious Play. Lunch, though? No, this was before streaming. Oh. Yeah, it was one okay. of those, uh, Nathan had done a, like, a narrative-focused semester, I think. Hmm. When Kentucky Route Zero was one. I can't remember some of the other ones. It's fascinating, because it really, it has, it makes so many references to Colossal Cave Adventure. Um, and it is, it is, would be considered an adventure game as well. I think there's something to be said. Adventure games tend to have narrative roadblocks. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I think the carrot on the stick is is the next set of the story. Mm -hmm. Role playing games don't necessarily have that much of a story, so that the you know your rewards are more that you can defeat more powerful creatures right. necessarily than get this chunk of story. Um, at the same time, there's adventure games and RPGs on both sides, which complicate all of this. You know, we could talk about the Quest for Glory series, which merged both adventure game which was made by an adventure game company but featured rpg elements hmm. and here we have a game that is definitely the peanut butter and the chocolate together as a matter of fact replaying it now i'm just i'm just amazed at how much this is an adventure game i actually i know that there's a point where this game flips and suddenly we have access to all these dungeons and then i guess it'll become more of a classic role-playing game but at this point for this bulk of this we are trying to gather clues we're trying to open up a bit of a narrative the resource management or the I, I mean we are leveling up we are fighting monsters we are getting more experience but that almost seems like a side thing that's going on it doesn't really seem that important right yeah. when does that flip happen I don't know because I've never gotten there okay and that does this well, I thought you played this whole thing no I, I tried about four years ago I was doing exactly what we're doing now which is like I'm going to get through this whole damn game wow. and then school got in the way and once you and that's the thing about these notes is once you kind of put this game away right you've got to start all over you, yeah but I wanted to mention this I was looking while we were just kind of sitting um, waiting for Chris who's extremely late today um, <clears throat> yes 
<laughs> I, I put it on the. I said something on Slack, didn't I? <laughs> I wanted to mention, and this is this is not just true of these old games, but how much the media itself gives away a little what you can expect in the game. So I'm currently holding up the two floppies that I have with my original Quest, the Avatar, which again I got Christmas of 1985. And here you see the first disc, Ultima 4. We have side A, program disc. That doesn't give us anything away. Side B is town. So I guess that's all mm. the information for each of these towns. That's not giving much mm. away. Side C, Britannia again. But then we've got side D, Underworld. So we already know at some point, because we've been playing this a lot. And again, when I tried to play this game a few years ago, I spent all my time in the Overworld. We know at some point we're going to get access to the Underworld. And again, this I don't think this isn't... But I think it's interesting that the textual media itself, the way it's actually is actually giving us insight into the world and the story. And again, it's not just games like Ultima Four had floppies. If you remember playing the first Baldur's Gate, mm -hmm. you knew yeah. how you knew that you were going to change a chapter. You you had an idea how much could be saved on a CD ROM. Right. So you always had a bit of an idea that you were getting close to where a chapter would change. Because yep. the CDs seem to match up so well with chapters, and I remember thinking that. And I remember being sad when I was like, oh, I'm already the sixth disc. I know that the game is reaching its <laughs> conclusion, right? right? I think that's interesting. Hmm. I don't know why, but I think it's interesting. Well, it is like chapters. You, you, you can kind of, like you're saying, you can I think it's a book see the, the thing, end. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, the same way that a book, even chapters or not, you know, just the thickness of how many pages are left versus how many you've traversed. There's a bunch of things like that that signal you know, pacing yeah. for you. Why do I, I'm trying to, re, I seem to remember having to switch discs a lot with some games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did, like, there would be moments where you would, you weren't even progressing, but there would be a little snippet taken from one disc and then you had to install yes. another one. Or Well, that was true of Baldur's Gate, if I recall correctly. You know, insert this disc because you were heading into the big city or something, yep. you know, and it needed that. And then ultimately there was something that made it possible for me to, Download it all to some other drive. I, at some point, I stopped having to do it. But. So here, I have a question about the combat in this game. You know, it has a kind of disconnect. You know, it just it just seems to represent the big bad world, and that's it, right? It is just the world out there is dangerous outside of cities. That's all it seems to be saying. And it's more dangerous if there's more of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right and that's that's all it, i mean and and it just seems to not do anything for the meaningfulness of the game to me but I, beyond I, little things like oh it's a skeleton now i can imagine fighting a skeleton versus imagine fighting a bandit or something and how much of that is the kind of the context of us playing it now because i do remember playing it and this like I, I clumsily two weeks ago or was it the last time we played i remember trying to make comments around how this combat is this and i'm doing it again i don't know how to explain this but i think about wizard i think about its peers wizardry and bard's tale and the combat in those games consists of not much more making a decision like your fighter in the first rank is going to hit the a key every single time right. for attack the three people in the back are going to hit defender parry or whatever the, the command was and there, there's certainly no spatial like here that's a big difference because you have to line yourself up here it's a mm -hmm. little arcade like right like you need to follow the X Y in order to get, have a shot, but but continue saying. No, I I didn't have much. I I was like, doesn't this seem a lot more sophisticated? And I don't know. I mean, I don't think this is as sophisticated as some of the combat options we would get in a modern day role playing game, right? See, yeah, um, that's so interesting you say that because I was thinking the other direction. Like, this seems cheap to me compared to like Bard's Tale, strangely. Why? Even if Bard, because it's almost like the difference between a text-based adventure game and an early graphics game, right? Like I could I could follow along if I'm remembering Bard's Tale properly. Mm -hmm. I could follow along in the feed and I could see a narrative, you know? That feed is here, but, but your attention, first of all, is on this arcade section mm -hmm. with these with these comparatively sort of, maybe it's just to my eyes today, but kind of disappointing little avatars, maybe I wouldn't have felt that way back then. Versus in Bard's Tale, you get this kind of rendered better picture of a villain, right? It may be static, right. or have a little animation, but that's it. But at least it's kind of richer, and you can kind of imagine looking at it in 3D, standing in the middle of a dungeon hall, you know? 
Yeah, I, I mean, you do. I mean, you do get those those profile shots. Yeah, I don't is know. this game though asking us to say, for instance, by is it going past that by providing oh. it in the manual, right? Oh, um, look at that. I mean, and also we've got this is. I mean, we're you know we're dancing around the fact that this is obviously from a top down th third person perspective, right? We have an avatar that we're following. Yeah. Bart's down wizardry. It's all first person perspective. The Maybe entire that's time. the big difference right there. Yeah, I mean, this has come up a couple times in conversation where, with the Ultima games, Garriott was setting out to have the work influence your life outside, yeah, beyond right. the game. Mm -hmm. right. And by, do, by having all these little bits and pieces to have you have to engage, by forcing Take you to engage with paratax yeah. and create your own paratax, you're, it's forcing you to um, allow the this kind of simple fl simplified world to seep into I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm thinking about this and I'm just thinking about it. a conversation that I don't know if we had it at the doctors and DMs recently but I've been talking a lot about most of the Dungeons and Dragons games that I run now okay all of them are now on Roll20 and I don't know how familiar you guys are with Roll20 but you know it's, it's a web based application that allows right. you know my long my the game that I play with that I put a lot of effort into is we play classic first editions with friends that I have back in the Bay Area and actually one of my best friends from high school is in Detroit, right? We can all play in Roll20. And we talk about it and then one of the things, one of, I, I don't know if it's a criticism, or I love Roll20, it's terrific. I can play music for sound cues, the fact that we can all play in our different areas. It keeps track of different things that we could, that sometimes are pain in the ass doing, on, you know, doing in a notebook. But what it has done is it has made us view playing D&D, and we've talked about this, from a viewpoint that's very similar to what we're looking at all right. before, because it's a top-down viewpoint. And we stopped doing, in some ways, the theater of the mind, I would say, yes. is a little bit diminished. Right. Mm. Because we right. start to view spatially. I, I was thinking about this. Yep. They're all in a subterranean dungeon. And I go out of my way to describe subterranean dungeons as best I can with my limited vocabulary of swamps. And, you know, <laughs> ichors dripping from the walls, green, you know, the acrid smell of swamp gas. At the same time, what I, I keep looking, and we're all looking at a screen the entire time. You know, yeah. We're not looking at each other. I'm not looking at, you right. know, my, in fact, we don't use the camera anymore because it takes too much bandwidth on World Tour. Mm -hmm. So we literally are only responding to people's voices. And so our visual representation of the world is the icons that we set up. And I don't know whether that's more or less immersive, but it does completely change the spatial relations. And so maybe that is a little bit of a segue to, we're talking about Bard's Tale Wizardry, which is all this first person perspective. We're moving into the world. Yeah. We're here. I don't know if you could do it in Roll20, but if you could, if you instead chose to throw up images, you know, like, like, um, uh, Fandelver, you know, uh, for example, if you Google that online, you, Minds of Fandel or whatever, you're going to find people have done like an elevation kind of thing of Cragmaw Castle or this or that. Like if you threw those images up there for a while you're talking together, is that more evocative than... And we do do that. And that yeah. does, Roll20 does allow you to do that. There's handouts that can quickly, right. you actually, there's a button where as the DM you can instantly make sure everyone's looking at the same thing, mm -hmm. which is terrific. Um, so yeah, you can do that. But, and it is great. I mean, it and. I don't know. Maybe Roll Twenty requires more on this, you know, this this textual stuff that we have to. Do. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going with it. It's funny you mentioned Fendelver because I, I did run all of Fendelver on uh, through Roll Twenty with a group of strangers uh, yeah. actually yeah, just to play it. Hmm. Yeah. I, I ran. I'm running that with one campaign, and then I start to start at Sunless Citadel with uh, another group yeah. and the old classics. <laughs> uh, so there was something in pause we just heard about. Right? Yeah. Um, well, you can steal horses and pause. Now, just because we can, does that mean we should? Excuse me, I'm going to go to the restroom. I started Van Delver with the boys for the second time. It's interesting to see how they, different styles of playing. And their ages again? 16 and 13. One's about to turn 17. Good yeah, Lord. that was the same thing with me, because uh, I... We had Julian at 19, Samuel at 15, and Audrey at 13, hmm. all gaming with Jill and me this summer, running them through. That's awesome. Vandelver, you know. But they're all in such different places, yeah. Did you see, I know we're getting a little off here, but did you get the, um, see that uh, call for papers uh, about game? I can't remember the journal. It had something to do with games, but it was to be written by... Um, a parent-child 
No. Yeah, I'll have to find that and send that oh, to you. Oh, I'd love to see that. That's interesting. It was an interesting premise, and I, you know, bookmarked it and then had to leave. Yeah, onto the, is it, did you put it on the calls thing on did Slack? I? I'm just wondering. Oh, I, I, I would have if I had had the ability to do it at the time. All right. Yeah, you did, yeah, 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 okay. So, yeah, I'd be curious if you want to throw that up there when you come across it. It's funny, I uh, remember when they were, they introduced the all-in-one Atari 2600 controller and they packed all the, you know, half a dozen games and bought one, brought it home. The boys were very young at the time. They were so unimpressed. They, yeah, they were like, all, they, they were all right. excited. And then just the other day, one says, how come we, how come we never play such and such anymore? I'm like... Are you kidding me? <laughs> How about that? It was oh, they were playing combat, and the boys have really gotten into a couple uh, YouTube channels that talk about the history of games and mm -hmm. it's a gaming historian. He's you know, pretty pretty simple, but like he does. Uh, the guy's a trained historian, and he does really well researched um, videos. And he'll take like an object or a game, and he was talking about combat and that old Atari 2600 game, and and they were fascinated by this. Like, you know, I tried playing this with you. <laughs> so how old were we? Uh, like three. Well, there you go. So we're in pause. We <clears throat> we beat the game while you were gone. Yeah, <laughs> the underworld was awesome. <laughs> Turns out that all this all this virtue stuff was crap, and we just <laughs> it was a shortcut, a back door. That looks like a healer there to your left. Is that right? Maybe yeah. we could get healed because we're not at full right now. A bit hungry. Food? Yeah. Some rations? That's another thing we haven't been doing is giving. Well, I think, I mean, I, I think, I don't, I don't know if, whether we want to be... The, the next question to stress is how methodically we want to be, but I, I do think in this first time, just trying to figure out where each of these towns is and what they're associated with is, is a good enough start. I think once we can get that information done, then I think we can start being methodical about what virtue we're going to go after. Oh, I see. They have the snake not because they're a healer, but because they're a druid. I agree with you on that, keeping uh, keeping the goal simple at this point. <laughs> you would do a fun reading of Ultima for would be the diff like the naming now we have a Pierre. Like what cultures are being represented to these names that are all over the place. <laughs> Does it say experience on that screen? Just a, a little digression. So Bard's Tale, the most recent Bard's yeah, Tale 4 52. just came out. Um, and I, I supported the Kickstarter, so I have a copy of it. I have no, no time to play it. And I actually wanted to play the old ones again uh, mm -hmm. through because I'm weird. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, just, just a quick comment about culture when I was just thinking about the fact that this person's named Pierre, is that the new Scarabray, um, and Scarabray is a real town. In well, I have a student studying right. tourism to it. Really? Yeah. Huh. She's studying gamer tourism. This is Heather Brinkman, another PhD student of mine. And, was uh, she in the class? Yeah. This? 
Yeah, it's a great project, you yeah. know, because this gamer tourism is something Scotland has actually And that's why people go to it because of... Yes. So Scarbrae is both in, so it is the home base in Bard's Tale, and it is featured in this game as well. Hmm. Um, it is the, because of that reference in my first edition game, it is their home base as well. Um, hmm. But I never really, I never associate, I never associated Bard's Tale, at least the original games, with any type of, you know, it's not like a generic fantasy setting. But the new Bard's Tale 4 goes out of its way to set itself in Scotland. Everyone has a Scottish uh, brogue. Uh, um, they use a lot of, they Scottish music as well as throughout the who's game. Who's the maker? In Exile, so Brian Fargo, the guy who made the original, hmm. um, the original games, which actually I thought was interesting. They also use a number of like Scottish runes or these. It's actually it's interesting because I mean it, there's nothing precluding it from being Scottish in the original games, but it, it felt it didn't feel like that. So it actually feel this, it feels strange to me. It feels different, yeah. It doesn't feel it feels less true to the original yeah. game because they've anchored it in a specific spot, which it's hard not to also begin to wonder mm. to what extent does an interest in the touristic kind of possibilities sure. and locatedness inform that. Um, hmm. What was, what's the connection between, okay, there's the, there was a Bard's Tale that was released several years ago, and it was yes. more of a top-down, third person isometric type, and it was... Action-adventure, non yeah. role-playing game. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, and it's embarrassing. I, I, some people really like it. It's, I mean, it's supposed to be irreverent. Uh, I was yeah. in, in Exile, made this with Brian Fargo again. Uh, I don't think he had the rights. I don't know what I don't know what the rights were, but the idea was they weren't bothering to make an old school role playing game because they didn't think an audience. This is way pre Kickstarter, mm -hmm. so they made this game that uses, but it, and it has a very real relationship. I don't think it exists in this, the world of the original Bard's Tale yeah. games, but uh, it's 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 supposed it's very you know it's supposed to be meta, making fun of role playing games, but it ends up being crude. There's a lot of sexist jokes that might be funny it might be at least somewhat amusing if they're funny but they're just crude mm -hmm. and they don't land the the remarks about role playing itself don't land for yeah. me some people really love that game they anyway it's, I, I solved it I, I only played it a little bit it seemed to come off of like the fable the success of fable and fable 2 yeah because I, I those I have not played but I've watched others play them and there's that same type of body humor mm -hmm. and it seemed like Bard's Tale was just kind of riffing off of that a bit but it wasn't compelling enough to keep going um, because I was looking for something that was a little bit more uh, actually I think I bought it because you could play the original ones That's, yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> they come with the original if you buy them on GOG no it's terrible and it's it gets worse and worse and worse I mean it's not even a good game but people, but some people like it We've got an armor shop here, so. Or is it armor? The other thing about this game is I, I get, yeah. you get comfortable with not having to pay attention to these things until you start moving slower, like in a uh, Bethesda game. I just want to go British. Uh, no, you can't. Oh, thing in. Yeah. yeah, British. Try Lord. Hmm. <laughs> 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 you never want to know. Large can your party get? Is it eight? Yeah, I think you eventually have a character class from so. It's from each one, mm -hmm. each virtue. Oh, but I mean, I think yeah. Well, I think every class is also lined up with a virtue. So at some point we'll get a shepherd. We'll get a what do we have? We have a bard. So we need to find a shepherd, ranger, paladin, tinker, druid, mage. Did you buy a horse? Yeah. Well, look at that. Are we faster now, I wonder? Into a horse. We did turn into a horse. How do you get out? Your 
York, but Christ. Should the town be called Hooves instead of Paws? <laughs> Change the name of this to Dad Jokes. Was that I was going to say? Was that a... <laughs> Wouldn't that, if it were, you know, if we're talking about changing the names, wouldn't that be, not be stable? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Ever, and anybody here ever remember a program called the Electronic Arts Adventure Construction Set? Mm-mm. Ben near the Codex, which is our final codex. goal. If its secrets are boundless, are they really secrets anymore? <laughs> Everyone knows about the codex <laughs> and its secrets. <laughs> its secrets are not restricted in any way. Wait. <laughs> what about wise? Hmm. Job. Oh, is this the same guy? Secrets. Do these people say something different to you later if you have a different set of experiences and That's a great profiles? question. I do not know. That would be pretty complicated. Very large. We have Sven Sal and Pierre in the same time. I'm not interested. The lumberjack, yeah. <laughs> Axe. Or chop. <laughs> He's gonna ask something. <laughs> Did we talk to the tavern owners? What do they sell here? I have to take a quick step out to meet with a student I couldn't otherwise reschedule. Right. I'll be back in here about 2.40 or so. What time is it now? 2.15. Thanks. I can't hand the, I can handle the, hand the, the collision of different European cultures. <laughs> no. We have French. Where's Sven from? Sven was like kind of Nordic some variety, but we're in a pub. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you're just you're opening with that. But see, that's that's uh, that's exactly how I would play this when, when I was younger. I was just not. Uh, and to this day, I'll, be, I'll confess, I have very little patience with adventure games. Hmm. And I don't, I don't, I'm not apologizing for that, but I don't know how to, exp it's, it, I don't know what it is. I'm, I, I think it's like, you go, you fall into that rabbit hole of, I want to see what the next visual mm -hmm. carrot is, right? Yeah. Um, so joining is always the first thing I would ask because that's the quickest. I want to collect the player, the other characters. It's. I mean, we can approach it so completely different, which is, you know, not a, you know, which is kind of interesting. You want to throw, funny, it, want throw down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. There must be words to do. I mean, I. People will call me completionist, but that's not true at all. Because when I, especially when I play RPGs, I don't. Skyrim's a great example, right? I yeah. literally play the stuff that I'm kind of interested in, knowing that I could full well have done the Thieve... You know, I never even touched the Thieve Town in, in Skyrim, right? But I had no interest. That wasn't the character that I had in mind. But when it comes to adventure games... But say, I, I view adventure games in some ways as, like, work. Um, you know, like... I mean, I will... I, you know, I still play all the Infocomp games. And when I sit down to do that, I, I buy a notebook just for that purpose... And I don't start off the game of trying to unravel the narrative. I literally, the first thing I do is map map it, right? I map it, I try to list all of the NPCs, I start trying to map relationships, right? I mean, I view it like an engineer might, um, which is interesting because that's not really how I generally think. Hmm. But I, 
I don't know, and I don't know why I do. I, I, I don't know. I find it fun. I mean, yeah. again, they, they got the concept of fun, which my game culture class and I are all, they, they kept talking about fun, and I was like, what does even fun even mean? But I find it uh, compelling. I like the, I like that work. Um, I never have the time to do it because, you know, like, and, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I've never gotten to Zork two or three because I know it's going to take me, <laughs> you know, months. You know, it's going to yeah. have to be on the back burner as I just sit down and map the whole thing. Because I but, think what always, if if I were to guess at something like why I, it's because there is a. The quality to those games that seem to make it so obvious that you're not in control, and the developer's hand is so heavy. You know, we've, we've uh, there have been a few games that have been played in at Lunch Zone. Um, <sighs> that's what I gotta I, I, interrupt you. I mean, that's one of the things that actually drives me crazy a little bit about Lunch Zone and like Cat's Mustache and these things. Like, I can't handle the idea that we're just gonna like play this game for like an hour. Where to me, it's like, no, this is a... I could sit down and, like, go methodically, and that is not going to be interesting for anyone on a Twitch stream to watch me, like, yeah. half this place, you know? So I, I've said before, like, at some point, I should probably be playing this on the side, too, so I can keep the notes. <laughs> so when we get back here, because the way that I will play Ultima, no one's going to want to watch me do that, right? Well, you know, I mean, two points. I, I don't think... This probably is not very... Make for good streaming <laughs> entertainment regardless of how you play it um but two you know it it up to, for for those lunch zones that were dedicated to a puzzle game i would be clawing at the walls by the mm -hmm. end of that hour because it would just i would it it would be this these strange feelings like i almost like my teeth would clench when you get in those moments where an obstacle was thrown in your way because you hadn't figured out the mind of the developer, and that absolutely drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, when we're getting at that, right? I mean, that's that. Have you read Twisty Little Passages by Nick Monfort? Oh yes. Okay. I, <laughs> I love that book, and I know that parts of it are rather clumsily written. Can I say that on Twitch stream? <laughs> so I'm trying to. I want to be friends with Nick Monfort. I don't get in trouble. Um, sometimes his writing's a little stilted. Shouldn't shouldn't be saying that either. Um, but I mean, his you know. His, his base assumption there that you know interactive fiction which is what he's talking about he's talking about text mm -hmm. adventures in particular are akin to the classic Egyptian riddle called the, the, the riddle of antiquity and the whole idea is we have to somehow understand how the designer's mind works right is that happening here like in, to be, in order to do that because and it, it, it's funny too by the way despite the fact that we play different I hate puzzles I freaking hate puzzles see I like like jigsaw puzzles I love jigsaw puzzles. Something my in-laws like to remind me of every Christmas. Mm -hmm. Well, do you? I mean, do you like the like? Would you do you like a game like The Witness? Do you like the? No, okay. because there's some. You know, there's a. I'm I'm thinking of a jigsaw puzzle here now, or when you're completely and to be. I haven't done one in, in decades. Um, but there's just. I mean, even the cat's mustache, like hearing where that name comes from, Man. like so aggravating to me. Like, why would you, that's just not even, that's not a game to me. That's not, that is, and I don't think of games as necessarily fun. I don't go down that road. Right. But at the same time, it's like if you're just making obstacles, why not just, you know, make a game that is, is impossible to win or, you know, some other avant-garde type thing <laughs> The game self destructs. <laughs> <laughs> I still Which has been done. I remember we were talking with this when well, we were looking at uh, Twine games recently, and I was like, I want to do the Twine Malware game, where literally it, <laughs> it erases your hard drive if you click yeah. on certain links. That would be uh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Damn, so somebody's gonna take. I should never say that public. Cause somebody's taking the idea and they're gonna make a big name for themselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, a huge audience. Um, of, of Nick Monfort. I, I, this, this puzzle thing. Uh, Stephen King had a. Uh, I think this is. What did Stephen. This is Stephen King? I have no idea what book it's from. I think it's from Dance Book Cop, which was a, a really interesting book that he wrote about. But I don't understand why you would suddenly talk about logic. But he says that logic. He uses a metaphor of a tractor that everybody has, right? 
that like when somebody asks you to do something that takes your logical mind, um, you know, you know that you're going to have to do a math problem that's mm -hmm. tough. You know you can do it. It's just a question of effort, right? It doesn't necessarily take some math. It should, should probably takes flashes of insight. For the most part, it's getting down and it's thinking through rationally. Like, how does this thing work? Like, how you know how uh, that you know you can do it. You just know it's a, it's effort. It's what you're kind of saying. You're talking about like why do we have such puzzles, which are in essence sometimes just gatekeeping the game, right? Yeah. That's the only purpose, and I hate that. Yeah. I I particularly hate that. Um, I feel the same way about like cutscenes. In video games, like it's like you, I'm, I, meh. There, I love there's. Cut, a, I love cutscenes. I, but I, that's because it's, it's the narrative suddenly coming in. It's the reward that you get in an adventure game. Suddenly, okay, I get a little bit more. I mean, it depends on the cutscene. Yeah. The cutscene in Metal Gear Solid is completely different than a cutscene we might see in a Sierra Online game, right? I used to really like them with Final Fantasy, but that was like sheer spectacle. I know, like where I would turn to the person. I mean, uh, my wife would be in the room. I'm like, mm -hmm. look at this. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I still have Final Fantasy. I mean, I look at it now going, I'm like, whoa, what? In, where were we at 20 years ago that this looked good? <laughs> but, it, but at the same time, it did. Um, anyway. Well, he, look, bring it to ultimate. There's no, so this is, I, I think you, we could make an argument that there are cutscenes. And then for those who can't see my fingers, I'm making quotation marks. In games, to some degree, I would say there's an early version of cutscenes in Wizardry and Bard's Tale. Maybe Bard's Tale more than Wizardry. You will suddenly have a character appear, and you'll see that the first-person perspective. I mean, I don't know how much of a... It's not a cutscene. It, it's, it's still in-game. You're still seeing it through the first-person view. I guess maybe, maybe this is bullshit. <laughs> I was just thinking what I Ultima 4 doesn't do that. We never yeah. leave the game. Ever this entire story is never there's never a part where we are going to suddenly be transported somewhere else and we're going to see well that's not when true. you die. We and saw it earlier to the the beginning. The beginning has that um, the tarot reading. Yeah, there's that. There's also the oh, the splash screen is kind of a mm -hmm. weird bit. Um, and we when you die, I'm sorry. We don't have interruptions in the middle of the game. Well, okay, actually, that's not true. So when you get, I mean, everything's not told in the mechanics of this third-person adventure style that we're fumbling around in. When you get, when you successfully say the mantra in the shrine for the correct cycles, all of a sudden you get a little picture, and I would say that that's like a miniature 1985 cutscene. Okay. Um, something happens in that yeah did you catch that note by the way the gate no. spell is mentorian is the mentorian yeah, the mentor wizard will teach it to us yeah he's in a hidden But it's funny, I mean, one of my favorite games of all time is, is Mist and Riven, which I do tend to think of just a fun game. And I think the thing about that, one of the reasons I love that game so much is because I, despite the fact that the puzzles are the nature of puzzles, they seem to be integrated so well. They seem to have a purpose for being in that world, and they seem to be integrated into the narrative so well that I don't mind them. Confession number three, I've never played Mist. I was just, we just we just played Riven in Stewart's class and um, yeah I wrote a, I wrote a paper for his, the last class I took with him last semester on Riven and it required me to play both Mist and Riven together. Actually, my paper was on both Mist and Riven. I wasn't just on Riven, but um, I came away with a higher regard for Mist than I'd remembered, and it actually the Riven's still great, but I found myself more interested in Mist this time. Uh. Alright, so you... 
We're going to have to leave today at 2.45. That's what it's going to be, too. Actually, 2.50, sorry. What time is it now? 2.28. 2.28. Did we have anybody in the comment fields today? Uh, no. It's been... At least I don't think so. I left my laptop in the library. Yeah, I would... I'm starting to become... It has absolutely nothing to do with me getting older. <laughs> but I'm interested in I, hearing what other people... How their tastes in games have changed. Because I, I'm starting to fear that my taste in games has not changed since I was six. And that would really... <laughs> that would be... Um, kind of embarrassing, I guess. I, I mean, I I go down the list of games. Like I loved King's Quest. I loved the old Sierra adventure games. Um, and those are adventure games, right? Absolutely. I mean, those are the right. Those. I. Big in the canon. I own them. I loved King's Quest, Space Quest, all those. I devoured them. Black Cauldron, and. There's no, I mean, I have no reason to start one of those up again because I know what I'm in for. The, the uh, figuring out what the commands are and King's Quest One is, 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 is a game design mess. Um, I don't know the last time you played it. I've never, I never played King's Quest as a kid. I, uh, I did play the Space Quest games, but about eight years ago, I decided I don't want to go through the King's Quest games. I make a lot of these decisions and never follow through. I don't know what that says run out of time. Um, but I, I, I could only go through the original King's Quest with the walkthrough. Well, yeah, that's and, and that's the frustration. You, you, oh, shit. And that game was, I mean, that game was specifically made to show off the technical capabilities of the IBM PC Jr. Um, a computer that is lost to history, by the way. I will, uh, I forgot to tell you, I picked up, um, Another copy of Morrowind, based on uh, some comments you had made. Yes. I, I did own it. Uh, I may even have the manual somewhere. In fact, my son has the map on his wall. I've bought it three times in the physical editions just because I keep losing that map, and that map is essential. And it's a pain in the ass to print out a PDF, which I tried. That game is so good. Well, you know, it's what's. I've played played every game in that series. Yeah. Oblivion did not strike me as I didn't give me that that sweeping sense that Morrowind did. Um, I I don't even think I bothered with it after a couple sessions with it. Really, I played it to the end. Oblivion? Yeah. The most disappointing uh, experience about it because I love Morrowind so much, hmm. and it, it, it loses so much. It's funny because uh, well, I hate the level scaling in it. But somebody did a uh, oh man, somebody made a a mod for Oblivion, Obscuro's Oblivion Overhaul, which fixes all the things that I didn't like about it, with the exception that it still keeps the ridiculous narrative in place. Gets rid of level scaling. Oh, I was about to say, if you can poison me. How do you... Oh, is it set up camp? Do you want to camp? Is it something that I have to Each. have a tent for? Or... Oh, no. Okay. I'll give it a shot. Oh, good. Whew. Um, How do you get off the horse? Those gems, pure gem. I think that tells you exactly where you are in a dungeon, but I wonder if it would tell us where we are in the wilderness because that'd be so helpful for tracking where these towns are. <laughs> uh, exit to get a horse. Okay. X, X for exit. <laughs> so 
Um, what's how do you get on the horse? Um, B for board. But you're talking about how we've changed playing. I am. I do play games completely, very, very different. The way that we've kind of been playing Ultima Four, which is just kind of like random jumping all around, asking everyone to join us, is how I played it when I was, you know, thirteen. But I now I, I really want to know what happens, and I want to get to the end of games. So I tend to be much more methodical, and I have an interest in that that I didn't have as a kid. I like spending the, the time trying to figure out the Montfortian riddle at the heart of the game. Yeah, I... Oh, look. I took a moon gate. Oh! There we are back at Magencia again. Well, it's good to know that we can reach Magencia by moon gate. Do you want to see if our snake is there? Maybe you have to talk to him before you taxi him. Oh, for crying out loud. So can you get poisoned in the town? Yeah, it's all that swamp area. So you have... I mean, this is a mechanic to keep you from... I mean, you have to be properly leveled up to be able to do this. It's just kind of obnoxious because this is actually one of the more enjoyable towns to goof around in. I haven't seen Nate the Snake. Talk to the... Can you talk to the ghost? Oh, maybe we can get the mantra while we're here. But didn't Nate the Snake give us the mantra? I don't know if there is one, because this city is not associated with a virtue. It's associated with a sin, right? It's pride, not humility. Mm. And I think humility is the shepherd town. In Britannia. Somebody standing in front of you, you can't go through them. Come on. You may have to attack it. Oh, oh, there's your opening. Well, Abshai has. Might end up in Britannia again. There's a little lead on narrative dissonance for you. Um, you know, it becomes a game. Death becomes now a game mechanic for us, right? Yeah. Like if we want to get back to Britannia quickly, so it means that we should never have more than two hundred gold on us. Yeah. And should we just spend it as soon as we? Too bad we can't have a bank where we could go save stuff. Oh, there you go. That's no, good. We want to be resurrected. Is there? Eh, there's Nate the Snake. I have to talk to him first, don't yeah. I? Well. Nate the Snake, one of the more obscure wrestlers. Did you ever see there's a... Are you into pro wrestling? Okay, yeah, pretty much so. There was a great documentary about wrestling in, in maybe a half dozen of its different flavors from amateur mm -hmm. on up. And that there was a one part of it Oh, there's a moon gate too. Should I go through? Go for it. Oh. <laughs> there is this it but one part about it is the reuniting of Jake the Snake with his estranged daughter. Hmm, I've seen this documentary. I don't remember I mean a long time ago. In the ring on the map? That's what that's what it is. It's something like that. It was only it was free on Netflix for a long time. I remember seeing it. I saw it like eight years, ten years ago. All right, Snake Man, where are you? One of my best friends. She got it. Jake the Snake Roberts did one of her tattoos. Did not do that again? See, this is what happens when you play too fast, man.
This is too fast. <laughs> God, this is really frustrating because the. I'm gonna make my kids play through all these games before they even are aware that new games like Skyrim exist. You know that that's the. I I think that's what I was trying to do when I meant. Were you here when I mentioned the Atari Twenty Six Hundred controller? Um, trying to like get someone used to that. That's the great thing about having children is that you can mold these little <laughs> creatures into corrupt them. Hey, you were talking about combat when I came in. Yeah, combat. Um, and it, you know, one of those little all-in-one controllers had breakout and all the your basic library for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred and. They just weren't impressed. They were already at that point where it just it had no, no interest to them. <sighs> sometimes I don't know. Sometimes the, I love. Atari. I lost my I, horse. I own, I own two uh, Atari twenty six hundreds at home. One of which is currently hooked up to TV. And <clears throat> my one son, we go upstairs and the first, all he says is Atari, 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 and he loves watching me play Asteroids. That's awesome. Um, Well, I was going to make a point that some of those games hold up better than others. Some of them hold up really well. But you, you, talk, you, you talk about, like, you know, we're talking about Ultima 4 and how so much of Ultima 4 and the way that we interact with this world actually happens away from the screen, right? The fact that, you know, we're sitting here with the... Well, one of the things that the, Professor Malaby and I were talking about that we kind of mentioned is he was saying, well, isn't... Bard's Tale Wizard is a little bit more immersive because you get to see the profile of these monsters that you're fighting. And then I'm showing, you know, the manual. There's a profile of literally every monster that we can fight. So instead of showing it on the screen, we have to look it up to see what yeah. this monster looks like. Um, what the hell was I talking but about? Atari mean? does the same thing. Oh, sure. Right? I mean, the the art, the amount of... The, have you seen the... Co I got it for Christmas last year. Have you seen the coffee table book of, of Atari art? That thing's beautiful, and that worked on me so much as a kid. I mean, from adventure to haunted house, even despite the fact that I was moving around nothing but a little dot, I believed I was entering castles and mazes that had because of the art, you know. Well, that's what makes. I mean, I, I think it was, was it Bogos that did the seasons game using the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. I heard about him doing that. It's like a poetry or whatever. Yeah. But there's this. I mean, you needed it. Oh, Yars' Revenge. What would that have been if you had no or or, or Warlord? What, That's what, that what game. Is going Talk about on? a game that holds up, by the way. <laughs> well, I was just looking at your your copy of Star Raiders over here, and I started uh, taking part, but I didn't want to if you didn't want people poking around. In the oh, that no, comes it's... with a comic book set of Yars' yeah. Revenge. So again, this extra diegetic um, material that we have, which allows us to kind of interface with the world. Yars' Revenge had a amazing comic which I read about a hundred times we're we back in Britannia yeah, yeah we poison may have died again. again what poison is not our friend poison boy is there no response to poison well, once we get a spell yeah yeah now Iolo has magic points can he cast spells yeah but he'll, he needs reagents so we gotta get to a, maybe we get a Magencia and start buying them up. so procedural this game <clears throat> As Jimmy Meyer pointed out on Digital Tangerine, a lot of people recommend not joining with other folks to keep the level scaling down, right? right? Because then the battles become out of control. I would say that that's not a bad strategy. I, I think, like I said, when we play next week, I would love to just concentrate on getting this map filled in. Meanwhile, I'd like to think that we're earning lots of experience. That's right. I wonder what the experience threshold is for. Anything golden, no poison or acid. Hooray. Please, you know, whether it's Bard's Tale, Wizardry, or Ultima, all of these games were so grindy. And <laughs> I mean, do these, the, the battles here, at least the battles, the, the random battles that we're getting, they, do they off? Well, Chris, you were talking about Final Fantasy, which I've never played a single Final Fantasy game, but I've heard that that's the critique of those games as well, is there's constant battling and grinding in the wilderness. Buying another horse? Yeah, let's... Uh, Did we lose it when we die? Oh, yeah. 
But what are, what are the advantages of having a horse? I feel like it just goes a little faster. Can you run away from enemies a little better? Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, Scott pointed out that uh, it's because of my incessant need for moving quickly. <laughs> so, uh, we got poisoned. I got poisoned the last time. But we did find a moon gate. We went to Magincia, which is surrounded by poisonous swamps, and trying to find Nate the snake again. I don't remember Nate the snake. Well, you're supposed to talk to him, and then he fights you. But mm -hmm. um, but Chris moves too quickly. And that's the problem with the horse is one tap and you move twice. Mm -hmm. So Trinsic is a good one. This is where we find fighters. I think you remember them. All right. Publius. Okay. Honor. So, so, so there's honor. Lost. Seven other virtues. Shame, maybe, could be an answer to that question. Hmm. Scott and I were talking a bit about whether tastes in games and the way we play them change over time. Because I was talking, like, I, I confess that I'm not a huge fan of puzzle games. Or even, I have, and even adventure games to an extent. I just get very impatient. Yeah. And I said, like, I, this is, I'm, it's embarrassing because it, it's been like that since I was very young. I just, like, King's Quest, I played all of those. But even then would just be, uh, come on, let's, let's go. I, I suppose, you know, this kind of grindy thing tends to appeal to people who are completists, you know, <laughs> obsessive, compulsive, you know, a it's little bit ready to sort of make sure they've seen every spot and, you know, and I'm definitely that way. Where, where have we heard completist earlier today? Well, I said I, I'm not, a, I'm not a completionist, it, but this, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I am with certain games. Right. But well, we missed, made the mention that Skyrim, I was happy to do the main quest and we call it a day. Mm. But with this game and with adventure games, and when I do, I, I, I mentioned Infocom games. I, you know, those yeah, are my favorites. Yeah, well, yeah, we talked about those before, but, Planet Fall and such. And you bring, but when I'm ready to play one, I have to put, I, it's a whole day, and yeah. I'm going to have my map, and I'm going to have my notes, and I'm going to spend the first few hours just mapping where every location is, and just every end Well, maybe that's because of, you know, you, it, you find rewarding as an end in itself the extra game process mm -hmm. of note taking it's not outside the game executive you know what i mean like the everything around the the paratex etc that you're producing um whereas you know obviously skyrim's not calling upon you to do that or making right. that much right. of an option and there's there's games that offer you know if i need i mean there are other games that are that skyrim is an example but i mean there's time i, I finished diablo 3 one and that's a game that requires no work at all was yeah, the, Diablo. I mean, Diablo is just it's it's just action yeah. in a way. You know, there's there's no no real learning. You know, You're right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Remember, we we're not supposed to kill the bull. Have we been here? Yeah, we have. Yeah. Okay. And this is this is intrinsic, right? Yeah. All right, so there's a fighter here that will join us, but uh, again, I'm not there yet. Caution our use of the adding to our party and our combat woes. So, Chris, I want to take you back because we, we we did talk about King's Quest, but we, we we moved on. So the the idea that we okay, you're telling me that you don't like puzzle games, but that you played all the King's Quest games. How the there's a the only thing I can think of is that it was just so novel because that's what we had with the computer. And those were the games that we owned and um, they weren't, I don't, 
I don't know, because those were a little bit different, too. Because I was used to Zork. I mean, yeah. Zork I liked. Yeah. See, I think that is something we don't talk about enough, which is sort of like your kids with that Atari 2600 controller not liking it, you know? Like, when I sat down in front of our IBM PC with the monochrome green screen <laughs> in, like, 1984, 83 and played a Star Trek game that was entirely ASCII characters, oh, yeah. right? And moving <laughs> across a grid, and this ASCII character somehow was supposed to represent a Romulan ship to me, or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the, I can't imagine playing or enjoying that game now, but I couldn't get enough of it, and I think the novel quality of it, the, the, the experience, maybe there's a way in which kind of throwing yourself, especially in that, the early days of that technology, how are we going to represent on the computer how are we going to represent yeah. worlds? How are we going to represent moving through spaces? It's fun in itself almost to be like, let me participate in that. Let me participate in figuring out how we're going to represent these things. But once we've all kind of made our decisions about how we're representing these things, it's not so fun to go back. You know yeah. what I mean? A kid raised today isn't necessarily going to find that visual grammar very compelling. What was... We played Rogue on the Lunchstone once. And oh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. There yeah. was that... We had that response of like, oh my god, I, I now it's all coming back and all these like, <laughs> the the way things looked and the way that you, um, the, the representations were were familiar right. and I was it Crystal Lee went blind, or everything went yes, dark. Yes, right, right, right. And it was it was just this one after the other was this oh my god moment. Um, yeah. I don't remember what the response was from the from everyone else who who had not played it before, but it. It still held up well something. for me. Yes, right, right, um, right, right. There was something about it. Uh, I remember the Star Trek game. No, there were so many. I think Avengers you'd expect had. some of them to continue to be interesting under this yeah. theory, right? Like some of them are going to be some some kind of different path for how to represent things, or maybe it foreshadows what we find now and we think it's cool, but other ones are going to seem like it's like a 300 dot matrix printer, you know? It yeah. looked amazing when it first came out, but then, you know, within a few hundred years, you see the 600, like, why did I ever look at a piece of this crap before? You know, be like, you know, there's, there's, I don't know, something complicated is going on. You guys probably remember, like, how ubiquitous, do you remember Print Shop? Sorry. Oh, like, yeah. The fonts from Print Shop and how, like, yes. like, when I was, like, 15 years old, everybody was using Print Shop. For so I see any, I see those old fonts with a dot matrix style to use this, or those old, the clip art that came with Print Shop. Yeah. And yeah. it just takes me back. And I got into way. all of those early Adobe fonts that you could buy <laughs> typefaces for <laughs> Windows. And <laughs> I, I have a special packs of them, and I picked my favorite. I still use it. It's Garamond, by the way. The most <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was a world that invited, an era that invited a lot of, hey, you can jump in and kind of weigh in or participate in uh, something very much in motion on a bunch yeah. of different fronts. Alan Daigle and I were talking about this last night. Um, the kind of more negative aspect of this is that we've become so, it's like what, we were talking about students. Like what do you train students for? You are mm. talking about soft skills and the more right. focusing on critical thinking because what skills do you actually train students for anymore? So going over my day yesterday and I said one day I'm editing sound clips, working on spreadsheets, doing a lot of things that 10 years ago, one person would have been in charge of. But now it all comes under whatever umbrella that I happen to be under at the time. Right. There's no, and, and you, the, you know, it's pedagogically speaking, it's a matter of, you know, hand-holding versus kind of trusting that your students know how to Google things yeah. anymore. And it's yeah. like, well, so what are we, so it's interesting. Well, all the work I did, you know, as an undergraduate film film major, all working and cutting on sixteen millimeter film is now completely useless, right? Oh. I mean, that skill itself. I'm not saying I'm not saying that the you know, the aesthetic things I learned or how to you know take apart a film, or how to create a, a film, you know, the visual aesthetic that I learned. Well, that's the that's, useful, that's but, the, the yeah, that is the piece that's transferable, right? But all those hard and fast skills. You know, but I did teach you to it. Ta it taught you you know, um, uh, ways of thinking about narrative, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. You know? but, I mean, after all, I think that's all the liberal arts ever was supposed to teach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Was a way of, of thinking, way of thinking about things, yeah. you know, that, 
that was going to sort of lead you to be ready to take on some new information, new context, new event, and have some something to be creative with, yeah. some lateral application, of some analogy to, to bring to bear. Well, I'm jumping out because I have this meeting in right, a few right. minutes. Right. See you, Scott. You guys can finish the game while I'm out. <laughs> and I'll see you in a little bit, right? Yep. Four okay. Months. Yep. Hmm. Well, Are you, uh, has this game exceeded the limits of your patience? No, not at all. I mean, there's still enough nostalgia involved that it's. Um, but it, but that, that's that's what brought it up. Is I play the same way I did. Yeah, Scott started laughing at me because I started running up to people and just asking them to join me. Yeah. yeah. Because and that's exactly how I played when mm -hmm. I originally. And, and he keeps saying in one way or the other. Maybe we don't want to have people join us. It's all going to get harder. Yeah, do, you or know. you know, asking what the commands are, and I'm just going down the litany of right. commands that. Right. You know, okay, let's see what what little bit of information, and that's that grind. And it, what I was saying before was that it, what frustrates me are those moments, like with puzzle games, where the hand of the designer is so heavy. Yeah, that it becomes frustrating, right. and you're, um, and I guess. And so that's, it's strange to think that that has not changed in decades of playing games that yeah. when the designer is so obvious and their presence is so overt, um, I don't know why that bothers me so much. And we were talking about cutscenes even. Yeah. Uh, Final Fantasy, why do these games just, they, they're crippling yeah. when they do that. Not, not that they're not enjoyable, but... Isn't it interesting, too, to, con to contrast that kind of grind, which I would call a kind of procedural grind. Mm. You know, there's, there's a kind of, there's only ever the kind of, I need to fill out this form, <laughs> essentially. Yep. Type this, type, get that input, output, input, output. And it's all very procedural is my word for it. I don't mean that in the kind of way it's usually used in programming, but mm -hmm. bureaucratic, you know, yeah. versus... Um, uh, Liz Lawley did a post on Terranova years ago called In Praise of the Grind or something like that. Mm. I felt it should have been called A Beautiful Grind. That would have been fun. But, <laughs> um, and she was talking about how in World of Warcraft at the time, this had been like 2007 maybe, something like that, um, she used to love to just sort of grind, grind materials. And, and I did too, especially in certain places, especially if mm -hmm. no other players were around, you could... It was a different kind of grind, is my suggestion. It wasn't procedural, right? Yeah. I've got I've got to grind panthers in this part of whatever jungle, you know, uh, and I find this right kind of landscape timing kind of rhythm, mm -hmm. where as soon as I finish the twelfth one, I step back over there, and it's only right over my shoulder, and there's that first one again that I can, hmm. you know, and there's little variation, and maybe this one appears sooner or later, and there's a kind of dance that goes on, where there's this constant fine tuning, and it's contingent. You still have to, you know, try and you're you're playing with efficient a kind of efficiency game as well about how you move and how what when to use a special attack that's on a long cooldown to maybe get two at once. There's a bunch of different. It's a bunch of open-endedness yeah. to it. It's still a grind, but you have some agency in how you choose to, you can gain something in a way by being more efficient or by being clever, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's I think that's a different kind of animal than what bothers you here. Well, it, because there's no rhythm. Right. It's all th this random, and, and I, my impulse is to say that, but that's also compare that to like the random encounter in in D and D, for example, right. where it, it does. Um, I I love those random encounters. I think it is. The, I I would put the randomness on Liz Lawley's side, not on this. Yeah. I think the randomness is in that landscape in World of Warcraft, where oh now it appeared slightly over there, mm -hmm. now it's pathing this way rather than that way, or oh now I got this big wandering elite monster coming through. Here, how am I going to make an adjustment for that? There's a, okay. there's a million ways. It's sort of like playing golf on a golf course, right? Even if it's the same golf course you've played a million times, there's, sure. there's, there's that randomness in the landscape. Whereas I don't think there's randomness here. 
you go north, you go south, you go left, you go mm -hmm. right. I mean, of course, there's randomness in like whether it generates a monster. Mm -hmm. But I think the cities are particularly boring. Oh, yeah. Because they're they aren't random enough. Yeah, uh, the cities of all things, where the wilderness, uh, by comparison, is where all the wandering monsters right. come out. Um, I, and the wandering monsters don't advance the story. No. So, I. I I also want to compare this to Minecraft, and that grind is a little bit different. Where you're just that's almost takes on a meditative quality. The, yeah, <laughs> which which she saw too, and I saw as well. You know, there in some of those spaces, if you get you know, you can't always do it all the time, mm -hmm. yep. but it is so dependable that it's like it, to me, it's this. It's a it's a contingent performance that you are just in the rhythm of. It's like being yeah. having your mojo going as a jazz musician. You know, mm -hmm. you yes, you're doing something new all the time, but you're just in the zone. Yeah. So you're doing it. You know. Well, it's also a nice. Those moments are nice for socializing too. Because yeah. Because that and keep, that's what she would do. She would have a conversation going over audio with the rest of the guild while she was just grinding. Were you know, this? Pacers. It's like you, as simple as it is, and as mindless as it is, it's. It's very difficult to carry on a conversation while managing right. these random encounters. It's demanding a lot of, of input from you for very little, you know, return. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is an, it's an interesting one. Um, I don't, again, I wonder how interested I'd be in it if I had not played it before. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there's something just over this hill, just, you know, there's always something coming up next but again it becomes this gathering of icons and yeah like <laughs> which yeah that, that the dated you know visual language is a little <laughs> tough all right maybe we should wrap it all up right here. thanks for joining us we will be here next week after meaningful play Well, sorry again that you're not going to make yeah. it. Well, I'm sure we'll...